Fans have weighed in, about 4,600 of them, and one Montreal Canadiens player ranks 100th in one category but doesn't crack the top 30 in the other. That's what fans say. What is reality? We're going to try and get down to the bottom of it. With Jack Fraser of EP Ringside, who conducted the poll, asked for the survey, and we'll talk about it on the SICK Podcast. I'm Marin Arrow. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports entertainment like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you. Marinero, the sick podcast brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. The beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark. And Lakage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs had a 50-goal score, it's time you go back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. I'm taking a look at my hair. I'm missing a little bit of conditioner. But what do you want to do? It's too late now. Nothing I can do about it. But what I can do is bring in Jack Fraser, whose camera I think is off. But all I want to do is hear from him anyway. Jack, we have him on the phone. What's going on? Not a lot. How you been? I'm doing extremely well. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, so... Uh, I had a chance to read what you put on Twitter, and it was a survey. About 4,600 hockey fans weighed in. And uh, when was this survey conducted? How long was it up for? Whose idea was it? And uh, how did it come about? So a lot of people have been posting, you know, these rankings of top 100 players or top 100 centers or what have you. They're all pretty arbitrary. Everybody kind of uses their gut feelings on them. And we spent so much time people talking about underrated and overrated players. But, you know, not a lot of people actually kind of go out and figure out how these players are rated in the first place by most fans. So, you know, it's the summer. People aren't really getting signed anymore. Uh, There's not really a lot of news going down. So I figured why not put it to the people? You know, I have a platform that's big enough, fortunately, that people are willing to, uh, you know, weigh in and, and, and give what they think. And so we went position by position, goalies, defensemen, all three forward positions, uh, and then we ended up with the list of the top 100 skaters, which I think is the one that uh, that you reached out to me about because there yeah. was uh, one one Montreal Canadian on that list, uh, and it's uh, who I guess we're going to talk about. Yeah, no, I reached out to you primarily because of the 100 uh, top 100 skaters and top 100 centermen. We know that Marty St. Louis wants to put together a team that skate fast, play fast, think fast. And we all know that the center ice position has been a very important position. It's one that we've been talking about for the last 15 years for the Canadians. I think Canadians fans are more comfortable right now with their center ice position that they probably have been for a very long time. But when you take a look at the way the fans polled and you take a look at the survey, it might be an area of concern for some people or it might worry some others. So uh, how long was the poll up for exactly? Each one of those polls was up for about two days or so. Uh, the thing with these kinds of polls is that after a while, they tend to level out. So the results that you get after like 1,500 people are pretty much going to be the same as what they look like after 3,000 or 3,500. So enough time for people to get their input in, uh, but short enough that we kind of were able to knock them out. And if memory serves me well, I think you ended up getting about 4,600 votes or so, correct? That was on, the, yeah, the centers, we got, we got uh, quite a few uh, people, I, I think, justifiably want to get their votes in on, you know, McDavid and Matthews and guys like that. For the rest of them, it was usually around 2,000 or so. Let's take a look at uh, the top 100 skaters in the National Hockey League. Here we go. All right, I'm going to wear the glasses for this one. Okay. I think the obvious, I think fans got it right. Connor McDavid, number one. Kale McCarr, number two. Austin Matthews, number three. Nathan McKinnon, number four. Up until that point, I cannot argue. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I I think by taking a look at it, I understand how voters are thinking and voting. 
they're voting not only with speed, but they're also voting about strong skaters as well. Like Sidney Crosby is no longer the fastest skater in the National Hockey League. I don't know if he ever was, but he's a strong skater. Nathan McKinnon, who's at number four. These are guys, Jack, who carve up the ice when they skate. Yeah, so I, I should clarify just a bit. So when we say skater on this survey, we're talking about just guys who don't play goalie. So I, I wouldn't trust uh, the Twitter mod to decide who is the technically best skater since probably 75% of them couldn't get across the rink backwards. Uh, this is really a combo of kind of all the positional polls that I ran, except for the goalies. So, you know, even though McDavid and McCarr would probably be very high on a, on a list of the best technical skaters, we're just talking positionally on, on this list. I understand that. Having said that, you know, Nick Suzuki is at 100, all right? Number 100. He's the Montreal Canadian. He's the only Canadians player to hit the top 100. I don't think he's the best skater on the Canadians. Who would you have? Uh, you know what? I'd have to think about it, but has Suzuki really been known for his skating? Um, it's a good question. Um, well, look, so again, again, Paul, Byron, Paul Byron is near the end of his career, okay? He's been injury plagued for the last year, year and a half, couple of years. As a matter of fact, you know, there are some doubts whether or not he's actually going to return and play hockey this year, but Paul Byron's always been a better skater than Nick Suzuki. Well, so again, you got to remember here, they're not they're not voting based on their skating ability. They're voting based on who they think are the best skaters, like positionally, like, you know, like just, oh, all just the, best, the top hundred best players. Is that exactly. it? Exactly. Yes. Ah, yes. You know what? Here, I, I was confused. Yeah. So they so they have missed the 100th best. I, I guess you could say player who's not a goalie in the NHL. All right. OK, so now Nick Suzuki voted by the fans, a couple of thousand of them they believe is the 100 best, best player in the National Hockey League, all positions with the exception of goalie. Hmm. Yes, okay. Uh, I take a look at that list. Nick Suzuki is behind. Hmm. It's a pretty good list. I take Nick Suzuki over Nico Hischier. I take Nick Suzuki at this stage of his career or at this stage of Claude Giroux's career. I'll take Nick Suzuki ahead of Claude Giroux. I'll take um, Nick Suzuki ahead of Jesper Bratt. Would you? Well, so the thing you got to keep in mind is, you know, Bratt did score at almost a point per game pace this season. A lot of, uh, you know, outside of Montreal, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about about Suzuki. I think a lot of the skepticism with him as a player is that the production hasn't quite hit a high point yet. You know, he's still around that kind of 60 point range. You know, obviously he's got the defensive skill. Uh, I, I just think around the league, people are just a little skeptical about that offensive upside that he hasn't quite hit yet. And, you know, Habs fans have a lot of faith in that uh, that playmaking ability that he's going to take that next step. I think around the league, you know, they're voting about what they've seen from Suzuki so far over the course of his career. And uh, I, I think it's the lack of production that's really hurting him in the eyes of these voters. I, I hear you. What was it, 61 points in 82 games in his third season in the National Hockey League? You know, if he had 61 points last year and now all of a sudden they can add to, you know, if Slavkowski is able to fill up, you know, fill out that line with Cole Caulfield, don't forget, they had a very, very slow start to the season, especially Cole Caulfield in the first 30 or 40 games of the season. If he plays a full season with Cole Caulfield and you're Ice Slavkowski and they show some consistency, that points per game is not going to be a problem. It might not be. The question is whether he can keep up the defense playing the way that he did in the second half. Because I, I think it's fair to say that he he was strong defensively in that first half. Probably the only half that you could say was playing well defensively, to tell you the truth. Uh, the production wasn't really there. That second half, St. Louis kind of lets him run, roos, uh, run, run loose with, uh, with Caulfield. They both kind of focus all on the offense. They produced a lot. But I think we saw Suzuki's defense start to slip a little bit as he started to play maybe a little bit more run and gun with Caulfield. So I, and I think that that's a big question for me is, you know, we know that he has the skill defensively to be one of the best defensive players in the league. Yes. He's shown it already in his career. The yeah. question is, can he can he keep the defense where we've seen it be before and still hit that kind of number one center production? You know, yeah, that's, I, that's I, the question I have. And I feel like that's probably yeah. a question that a lot of these fans uh 
probably have. And I guess we'll, we'll see as he continues through his career. I think at the same time, if you take a look at that team last year, Carey Price is injured for like 95% of the season. He plays the last handful of games or whatever it is. Shea Weber doesn't play a game all season. Uh, Jeff Petrie's a shadow of himself, probably has one of the worst careers, one of the worst seasons of his career, if not the worst. Ben Sherratt's traded. Joel Edmondson was hurt for at least half the season. Um, Philip Deneau signed with the Los Angeles Kings. Uh, Eric Stahl wasn't there anymore. Uh, Thomas Tatar wasn't there anymore. Um, Paul Byron was hurt. Uh, I mean, you add it all up. I mean, you know, that team was demoralized. That team had a short summer. You take a look. I mean, it'd be hard for anyone to to look good defensively on that team last year. I mean, they had a, a, a coach change. I mean, that's usually when you have a coaching change because things aren't going well. And look, you're not going to get an argument from me that they weren't going well. The thing is, you know, fortunately, with with some of the stats that we've got, we can identify who are the good players defensively on a bad defensive team. Like I alluded to, like Suzuki's defensive numbers in the first half of the season when the Habs were just a complete catastrophe under Ducharme. His defensive stats were still elite once you kind of adjusted for the team that he was on. Same thing with Arturi Lekkonen, who just got great defensive results no matter who he played with, even as the Habs were a complete calamity. You know, Suzuki has shown the defensive skill to be able to, even on a team that's not playing well defensively, to be able to kind of be the one guy who kind of stops the bleeding when he's on the ice. When he was playing in the second half of the season with Caulfield, he got the offense back. He was far better offensively than he had been in the first half the defensive numbers kind of fell apart. And and I think that's justifiable. You know, you're down the stretch. The team's already losing out. You know, you're finally actually having fun playing hockey for the first time in a lot of months. You're playing with Caulfield. The goals are going in. Uh, the question will just be kind of where's the balance of those two things? Like, is Suzuki able to play with Caulfield and, and score all those points that he was able yeah. to in the second half? While still, you know, even though I don't think a lot of people expect the Haps to be a, a superb defensive team next year, you know, while still being that guy who, when he's on the ice against the top competition, the other team is not getting the puck and not getting chances in the slot, which he's done on poor defensive teams in the past. The skill's there. It's just whether he's able to kind of balance the two. Hey, Suzuki and Caulfield together, that's entertainment. Speaking of which, the WWE returns to the Bell Center for the first time in over three years. Tickets on sale now for WWE Friday Night SmackDown on Friday, August 19th. You can purchase tickets on Ticketmaster.com. We're also giving away some free tickets. All you have to do, listen carefully, is subscribe to our YouTube channel of The Sick Podcast and comment WWE Sick on this video, and you have a chance to win yourself a pair of free tickets. Pretty cool. All right, okay. Uh, we talked about different surveys that took place. The one that actually had the most voters, which was just over 4,600, were the top centers in the National Hockey League, Let's bring it up. All right, there you have it. Connor McDavid at one, Austin Matthews at two, Nathan McKinnon at three, Leon Dreisaitl at four, Sidney Crosby at five, Alexander Barkov at six, Braden Point at seven, Patrice Bergeron at eight, Sebastian Ajo at nine, and Jack Eichel at 10. It's hard to argue with that list. Mind you, I would have liked to have seen um, Sebastian Ajo uh, crack the top 10, but he uh, uh, well, he did. Pardon me. He's at nine. I would have liked to see Jack Hughes crack the top 10. Would have liked to see Matthew Barzal talk crack the top 10. But I don't have a problem with the list. Long story short, I don't. But Canadians fans that are watching this are probably going to have a hard time seeing Nick Suzuki at number 32. Jack, if I would ask you for the way you do your work with EP Ringside and when you put all your numbers and you put all your metrics together, I don't know if you yourself had a chance to do the exercise, but if you have, where would Suzuki actually come in when you put together all your, your data and all your metrics? That that's a tough question. I, I haven't done it yet. I usually do it at the end of a uh, at the end of the off season and I write up a whole big thing for elite prospects, uh, which I'm I'm planning on doing. You know, I'd probably have him around the same area. Maybe, you know, there's a couple guys on that list who are above him who I would probably lift him above and, and frankly you know there's a couple of people probably a little bit below on that list who i would say are, maybe are in a similar tier to him I, I you know i think that the concerns that i that i raised with him before 
still hold true for me. I, I think he's kind of in that tier of the guys who I see at this point as being kind of strong second line centers who have the potential to take the leap and become first line centers. Uh, and, and, you know, you say, you know, 32nd rank in the NHL, that's barely at that number one spot, but maybe not a guy who, you know, you'd be super confident marching with as your number one center. I mean, the Habs took Slavkovsky. Clearly they see Nick Suzuki yeah. as their number one center of the future. I mean, they signed him to that very long contract. Obviously that was a different front office, but they signed yeah. him to that long contract because they think that he's going to be a number one center. You know, he has the playmaking skill. He has the defensive ability. He he has, I think, a leap that he's got to take to get himself into that kind of higher tier where, you know, he's not only he can play on the first line, but he can really drive a first line uh, and and be kind of the, the top pivot on a playoff and contending team. You know, honestly, for, for a guy his age, for a guy who's who's been in his situation, I don't think you can, you know, I don't think 32 is anything to really sniff at. Uh, there's a lot of good centers in that range. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I mean, you look at the number of values next to these guys, there's a lot of kind of players who are in a very similar tier to one another. You know, you can make a, a, a thing about always oh, he's right below Josh Norris, who he obviously gets compared to quite a bit being in the same division. I yeah. mean, they're separated by tiny decimal points. You know, I got it, yeah, really, he's kind of in he's in the right tier there with with Nico Heischer and, you know, uh, Trevor Zegers, Bo Horvat, you know, all all good players. But you know, I, I think Suzuki, he's at the age when Habs fans can maybe be a little bit optimistic that a strong season this year is going to maybe take him to the next level. I said this before in terms of the best skaters, which basically, like you said, ranks all position with the exception of goaltenders. I think at this stage of Evgeny Kuznetsov's career and at this stage of Claude Giroux's career, I have Nick Suzuki ahead of them. I also have Nick Suzuki ahead of Nico Heischer, who is a young player, but I think Suzuki's I think he's ahead of him slowly, a little bit. I mean, I think it's close, but I think he's ahead of him. I think he's got um, more offensive upside and more offensive potential. But I will say this. You know what's interesting about this list? There's a couple of things that stand out to me. Is that there's been a lot of talk about Pierre-Luc Dubois, especially over the last month. He was at the draft in Montreal. Um, a lot of people close to the situation believe that the Canadians were trying to make a deal for Pierre-Luc Dubois before they were trying to make a deal for Kirby Doc. Uh, we had a chance to talk to Murat Atesh of The Athletic, who has actually joined us on the SICK podcast. And he said that if he was the Winnipeg Jets and the Montreal Canadiens wanted Pierre-Luc Dubois, and it appears this management team does, it goes back to the last management team who did as well. They really tried to acquire him at the draft when he went, um, he went third overall at the time to the Columbus Blue Jackets. But um, what's interesting on this list is that Nick Suzuki – is ahead of Pierre-Luc Dubois. So for all the Canadians fans asking for Dubois, well, hockey fans who weighed in on this survey, about 4,600 strong, if they had a chance to trade Nick Suzuki for Pierre-Luc Dubois, it looks like they wouldn't do it, Jack. I, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't do it. And, and I'm, I'm higher on Dubois than I think I, I, quite a few people are. Uh, you know, I think he's got a really good offensive toolkit. Very good at creating chances for himself. Good dual threat. He's not just a playmaker, not just a shooter. He does it both. Good kind of one-on-one -on -one player, uh, including defensively. But there are holes in his game that I think do hold him back from being, <laughs> pardon me, from being a kind of high-end number one center type. I, I see him yeah. as being <clears throat> consistency is one of them. By the way. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, you you see him kind of play. In the playoffs, you know, he has a track record for playing extremely strong hockey. He's a heavy player, strong physical player. I think Habs fans would like him quite a bit, but he's not somebody that, especially given their respective ages, uh, you know, Nick Suzuki being, I think, just slightly younger than him. Yeah. You know, I, I think he's a guy that you kind of bring in as a second line center behind Suzuki because I, I don't think that he solves any problems that, you know, getting rid of Suzuki would would allow him to fill you know not they're kind of if they're, I can, they're, they're roughly not, similar players yeah pardon me not a lot of people think that uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to be a Winnipeg Jet for the remainder of his career no. they actually believe that in a couple of years from now he'll either go to free agency or the Jets will trade him before that because they'll probably realize that they're not going to get him on their contract either so at that point you can either trade for him in a couple of years or you can try and acquire him as an unrestricted free agent a couple of years from now. Also, in ending, what's interesting is newly acquired Kirby Doc is on this list. 
I believe at number 67, which would be right at, I believe at 67, and Christian Dvorak at 72. So based on those voting, Suzuki's your number one center on the Canadians. Kirby Doc is number two. Christian Dvorak is number three. And the Canadians would have three centermen in the top 72 centermen of the league. They would. I, I'm a little skeptical of that Derby, uh, that Kirby Doc ranking, uh, but he certainly has the potential to be in that area. Uh, it would be it would be nice to see him able to kind of break out outside of uh, Chicago and get there. Um, I'd recommend anybody uh, who's interested to check out uh, my colleague Mitch Brown wrote a deep dive on Kirby Doc's game. He actually also wrote a, a, a parallel one for for uh, Alex Romanov, which was uh, which was also terrific. Uh, yeah, you know, like the, the Habs center depth is shaping up to look decent, but a lot hinges on Suzuki getting to that top line level and on Kirby Doc getting to that second line level. And I don't yeah. think we've seen either of those players for a sustained amount of time be at that level yet. But the Habs have put a lot of faith in that happening. And, you know, like you said, maybe purely to boy is something coming in the future. I, I hope for their sake that that's something that they'd look at doing as a UFA thing down the line and not trade assets for that player. Now, I don't know if he really fits the timeline of what they're building right this second. Yeah. But, you know, they've they, they've staked their claim on kind of this is the way that they're going to go down the center in the future. They clearly have a lot of faith in these younger players. Um, they have the potential to be a strong center core. Uh, but I you know, would not be super, super confident in the very short term that this is going to be one of the better center cores, even in their division, let alone in the league. But they're young. They should be fun to watch. The St. Louis system will hopefully continue to run like it did last year and and be very entertaining. So even if I would expect them to probably lose quite a few games next year, hopefully they're losing games in the way that they did in the second half last season and not in the demoralizing way they did in the first half. Okay, let's say if the fans are right, and this is pretty accurate, okay? In their estimation, this is pretty accurate, okay? I'm going to tell you this. It's encouraging for Canadians fans, and I'm going to tell you why. This is the way I look at it. 32 teams in the National Hockey League, correct? So for you to have a number one centerman, you'd have to be 32, then another 32, then another 32. If your top three centermen are in the top 32 plus 32 plus 32, which is top 96, that's where you should be. If you're under 96, obviously, that's better. According to this list, three defensemen in the top 72, which would be two teams uh, and a quarter. That's a pretty good average. It's not bad. It's pretty good. I don't know if you got exactly what I did there. <laughs> I don't know I, if no, I, I did. I got you. Yep, you got you, me? All right, but I, yeah, you know. You got it. So, look, what I'm trying to say is, if you have three centermen in the top 96, because you do 32 teams three times, one center per team in the top 32, then that's where you should be. That they have three in the top 72, that's a pretty good average. Obviously, if it would have been top 50, it would have been better. It would have been top 40. would have been even better. But it's encouraging. It's encouraging for sure. What's the next thing you're going to work on? You are very close to the fans, and usually what you see them do or what they want is something that you give them. Can you tell us what you're working on next? Did we lose Jack or is Jack still here? Jack, did I lose you? Going once, going twice, going Jack. Not exactly the way I would have wanted to end the podcast, but this is the beauty of when you're, what do you want to do? This is the way it is sometimes. Tell your friends about it. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, at The Sick Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. And once again, by subscribing and commenting WWE Sick, you have a chance to win a free pair of tickets to the WWE SmackDown, Friday, August 19th, returning to the Bell Center for the first time in three years. It won't take me three years to come back. I'll be back in a couple of days because I do the sick podcast every couple of days. I'm Marinero. Double shift your best players. I would double shift Nick Suzuki. It doesn't matter what that chart says or what the survey says or what the fans think. I love him.
I double shift them. I should double shift myself too. Ciao. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature, and Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you.